everyone and welcome. I'm James Milan and you've come to Talk of the Town. Uh, today, um, we're going to be talking with uh, clinical social worker Ann Westcott, who has been at her practice for decades and who, I have to say, has also been my good friend for a number of decades. Um, Ann, thanks so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here, James. Um, I wanted to say that, uh, you know, in talking to a number of people uh, over the last uh, couple of weeks, um, it has come clear to us here at Talk of the Town that um, there are a number of what could be called front lines um, in, mm. The, mm. in what we're dealing with at the moment, these extraordinary circumstances of the pandemic. And I see you as somebody who provides therapy, who provides who instruction both to fellow uh, fellows who are also practicing uh, therapy themselves, as well as your own clients and patients, et cetera. Um, I see you as being on uh, one of those front lines. So what mm -hmm. I'd like to do today is have you, as best you can, provide uh, open the window a little bit on what your own experience has been um, and, uh, and therefore kind of shine a little bit more light into what is happening uh, behind a lot of closed doors uh, like, mm -hmm. like I have right here in my house and you and yeah. yours. I'm and sure. I and mine. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. So to begin with, give us a sense of like what your work is like generally. Who, what kinds of folks are you in contact with? What are the different mm -hmm. aspects of what you do? So then we know, uh, you know, where yeah. you'll be speaking from. Well, my uh, clinical practice has predominantly been focused on supporting families and children. Um, I, had a, I have a specialty in working with children impacted by trauma and severe psychological stress. So ironically, that's a kind of something we're all experiencing right now, unusual conditions isolation. Um, so right now I actually do a mix of things. I do direct practice to children and adults and then I also do a lot of consultation and training of therapists. So it, I feel like in some ways I'm trying to support the frontline clinicians who um, are really working all day every day trying to support people as they can and then I'll slip over and be one of the frontline cl clinicians during part of my day, um, meeting a lot on phone and telehealth. Um, so it's yeah, you know, it's you, you're another example of uh, something that we ha again have discovered, which is that we are all familiar because you hear it all the time. The drumbeat from the from the the media, et cetera, is how many people have been idled. Uh, in this country. We, however, here at Talk of the Town, happen to be talking to people who are as busy or busier uh, yes. than they usually are. And it, it's just an interesting uh, thing to point out. So I'm sure that you also are, that that, that is also the case for you. Um, I was wondering to start with, uh, what you can tell us about now that you're having to do everything you do remotely. So with your mm -hmm. own direct, uh, the direct services you're mm -hmm. providing to, to to clients. How has that been impacted by the fact that you have to do it in some other way at this point? Yeah, you know, when I think about what's happened for me and when I listen to other people, I think the thing that's surprising us the most is how many people want to continue meeting. How many people, um, you know, are reaching for it, um, finding it really important, creating the most amazing ways to meet. I have clients that will get in their car and put their phone on the dash because that's the only place they have any privacy. Mm. Um, people going for walks during their therapy session, holding the phone next to them because that's, again, a place where they feel like they can get a little bit of space to themselves. Um, I think that's a kind of surprised all of us that when there was no option besides you know zoom or telehealth or internet people were have been so amazing about making it work mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah. yeah, clearly the the need is <laughs> hasn't dissipated at all, and in fact, it is probably increased, it is increased. From, the, from their end. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, so therefore, people are are it's unsurprising in some ways, although kind of heartening to hear that people just figure out, you know, use their yeah. ingenuity just to figure out how to do that. Adaptive and resourceful, and I do think the needs are changing rapidly too what we were addressing, you know, for me, what I was working with clients in the room, that's really helped us think about how to support people in these new conditions with a whole new set of worries. And they're all over the map. Um, and I, I feel like there's like either the quadrant of people who are working super, like a lot with heavy stuff, frontline hospital medical, but also, you know, I have a few um, people I work with who are um, teachers and here they are some of them are trying to run a class online with their students while their own kids are home trying to study and then we'll have other people who have nothing to do and are really you know in that kind of almost on pause mm -hmm. and um, so really different experiences yeah and how much of what you are doing in terms of seeing the clients that you have seen for a, a while now how much of what you're doing feels like okay a natural progression and just moving forward with what you've been working on throughout you know some period of time mm -hmm. how much of versus how much is really just almost completely dominated by mm -hmm. the current conditions and the effects of uh, covid you know covid-19 concerns i think you know it's a really valuable question because in some ways i think the crisis actually like magnifies those places that people have had struggles prior. So the themes that we might be working with, like with, a, you know, some kids I have, you know, if there's conflict, like in the family, um, this is a really hard time for separated or divorced families to negotiate child um, transfers back and forth. I mean, that's always a little tough time for kids and families. And that's when it's blended. But now with COVID, it's had this whole nother layer and, and around safety and who's in the home and the tension there and just trying to help people talk it through and think it through and, and not take kind of boundaries for health as, as, you know, hurt by it or feeling pushed away or rejected or not getting what they need. Um, so, and also in another way, like I have a, a wonderful people that I work with who are worrying about their elder parents in a way that prior to this, it had been kind of managing aging parents and how do I cope with, you know, should they be driving? I've got to get them to a doctor's appointment and their own stress. It's a whole nother level of worrying, but not even being able to go, go to them or to meet right. with them. And so it feels like it magnifies the previous things we were working on. Um, and then for some people, it brings whole new things up. Do you, yeah. you know, if, if, and it certainly makes yeah. a lot of sense to me just hearing that the things that you already work on would be magnified, would be exacerbated as so many things have been, so many kind of uh, low level kind of things that fester constantly yeah. within relationships or in larger contexts have just been, you know, exacerbated by, by what we are all dealing with. Um, how does that affect you? Um, by which I mean, um, are you able just to, to address, so now folks are, are even more anxious or concerned or fearful or, or all the things that you deal with. Um, do you find that you need different techniques for yourself to be able to address those things? Or are you just kind of doubling down on what you've always known and done? And, and how do you deal with that? Um, I, I'd love to hear how other people, what I can really share, I know what I do is, what I've been reaching for is things that are extremely useful right now in the moment that can help people, you know, calm something if they're starting to really blow up or actually find some energy if they're finding themselves super like, tired and depleted. And frankly, the very things I use with my clients, I'm using with 
therapists I support, and then I'm trying to practice them myself. Mm -hmm. um, one so of the kind of, give us examples of, of, of that kind of thing. So one of the things I did, um, really the first week of COVID, I said, okay, and in a, in a morning, I had a few minutes before everyone else was up, and I said, what is it that I do in a day that helps me like be my best self, like bring my best self forward? You know, just not about COVID, just like in general. And I made a list of like 10 things. <laughs> and it turned out, it was crazy. It was simple things like go outside, uh, get some exercise, uh, spend a little alone time. For me, I really enjoy yoga. So that was something I thought, okay, do that. Um, make a good meal. Uh, go to bed and get up at the same time. Uh, something will get dressed in the morning, shower and get dressed. Like there were these really simple things. And and very I concrete, in, very concrete. Very doable, right? Mm -hmm. Not some pie in the sky thing, like I'm going to meditate every day for half an hour. And I just committed to try to do those and have been stunned at one, I should do them without COVID because they're really good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but two, I could feel and I could look at a day when I hadn't done them and I could see how much more stressed I was at the end of the day seeing people. Mm -hmm. um, and over time, the other pieces I realized, and I don't know what people are doing for work, but Zoom is incredibly fatiguing. The screen is really rough on our nervous systems. Mm. and. I think teachers and therapists and maybe people like you, um, but kids are ending up spending a lot of time in front of a screen. And um, even over more, right? We were already worried about the amount of right. time that children spend in front of screens or all of us. But for all human beings, like I realized, wow, it makes me irritable when I get off it. It makes me kind of tired and a little foggy. Um, and it's really easy to spend a lot of time on it and not realize I haven't moved from my chair. <laughs> I, I had that experience. I, we are speaking in the afternoon and uh, this morning I had an interview and uh, it was a co very compelling one and talked to the person for a little while afterwards, talked to my producing colleague. Yes, found out what I was getting up. Oh my God, I've been sitting here for an hour and a half and that's... Yeah not a good thing yeah um so if i like take that to like working with clients like in the moment right now like if we weren't a little constrained by the camera i'd be getting up and showing people some things they could do to make their bodies feel better mm -hmm. and um, even with clients they might be stressed or emotional and sometimes i'll just say well just cross your arms and just rhythm back and forth or do it on your legs or just move your feet back and forth um, and these simple little things can actually start to make our bodies feel better so there's there can be like a a, a clear line going from body back to mind um, yeah. in the same way as we are familiar with trying to get our you know starting with yeah. our mind and trying to get our body to do things yeah, well, that's, that's enormously helpful too. It is, and and I teach this a lot when I teach um, people, parents, trainers, whatever. Basically, one of the neuro thoughts is that for about every one, you know, a telephone line down from our thinking brain to our deeper brain, our body and our emotions, there's like one line down for ten lines up. Mm. But turns out, if we can get our bodies moving we can much more quickly get ourselves in better headspace and usually calm down a kid. Or a, like I, I have a, my mother-in-law here or a stressed out, anxious um, senior if you have them living in your home. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I'm so glad that you've mentioned that because of course your own focus, as you said, is generally working with children and their families. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of us, I myself included and yourself included now, who have uh, you know, older members of our family here in the house. Yeah. And they, I have found through my own experience that um, you don't 
my mom, who's here, just cannot get enough stimulation. Uh, she can't supply it for herself. In general, it would happen from being able to go outdoors and engage in different kinds of communal yeah. activities. And those are simply lacking. And then, of mm -hmm. course, you have that add-on for the older population that so many of them are not comfortable uh, with this, the very technology that the rest of us are using kind of yeah. to survive in a lot of ways, and especially to connect. Yeah. And so uh, I don't know, what, 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 what do you have to offer for me and uh, those of us uh, similarly situated? Good suggestions for what we can do uh, in, in this situation to mitigate things? Um, if you're any place where you can go for a walk with them, go for a walk. Yeah. Um, it just, the human contact, the other piece for us that's really regulating for kids and parent and grandparents and all of us, um, as long as we kind of check out and have permission, is touch contact. Um, hugs, um, little massages, even walking arm in arm. A lot of elders would feel better if they could hook in with you and kind of use you as a support. Um, and just that warmth and that touch contact is really good for our immune systems and regulates us. And um, one of the things I've been hearing from people who are alone in their apartments or homes who that don't share is that it's now like week three for people and they're starting to really describe this kind of depressed, anxious feeling from lack of human contact. Yeah, literal contact, right? Literal you, touch contact. Not just social contact, like we're, yeah. we can get through a screen, but that, yes, that touch mm -hmm. contact, as you were saying. And yeah, that has seemed to me right from the get-go here as, wow, we are going to be, as a society, paying, quite, and as a globe, I guess, really paying quite mm -hmm. the price for that physical isolation yeah. that is so vitally necessary to get through this, but is so bad for us in every other way it seems like yeah we're we're social animals and we we thrive in connection maybe not too much i think that's another piece that's been really important is encouraging people even in their cramped places like and i do this with myself and parents like talk a lot about can you find like a safe place or a little bubble that can just be your child can they create a little space somewhere? And kids like oftentimes like tunnels or forts or cozy spots. But this idea that at this point when we're all on top of each other, it's like we all need our own little sanctuary. Doesn't have to be big, but one place where we know it's just us. Um, and yeah, having, and um, you know, if, if you're lucky enough to be able to fashion that for yourself. Yeah you are lucky because we have uh, in previous conversations we've had um, it, recently we have spoken to people who either themselves or who study those um, or in some way are in contact with the many 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 millions of people who do not have the luxury of having a room to themselves as i do yeah. right now in my own house yeah um, but instead have to find some way to carve out what you're talking about i think within a situation in which already four people are crowded and now they have eight because they've brought their family members back in with them. Back in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are there, I mean, does it need to be, are there techniques to try and do that that aren't necessarily physical? Uh, you in know, other a, words, big where you're, of, a big piece of it is reducing sensory input, so sight and sound. And for children, they, for kids particularly, they like little nooks you know it could be i had one kid make a nook between the wall and the um, couch i mean so it was like a four or three foot square it wasn't a big space but it was their little space and they you know put up things and put pillows in it and it was just this little cozy spot they could go to that was they knew you know that's my nook when i need a little away space and it was still in the family living room you know, that's uh, I, I'm just a, a little aside that that's so it just kind of resonates for me because um, I, I don't know if, how much viewers are going to be able to relate to this very popular uh, series been on TV the last few years, Stranger Things. In that series, 
uh, one of the main characters and spends a lot of the first season in this kind of fashioned little den, this little yeah. cave uh, underneath a, a table. And yes. Uh, we had in our house that was on at one point and we had a couple of kids between five and 10 who were just walking through. They weren't watching it or anything. And they looked at that and they said, whoa, that is so cool. And they just, they weren't paying attention to any other aspect of it. Just this little thing that mm -hmm. this little home den that had been, mm -hmm. uh, that had been kind of fashioned. And yeah. they just were so drawn to that. Yeah. Yeah. And we found that even prior to COVID, that was one of our real tools for helping kids with um, trauma and severe stress because there's a sense that we all feel better when we're kind of in a safe space, when we feel you know, protected. And, and right now, a lot of us are finding our homes to feel a little, it feels a little safe once we get in them. Mm -hmm. And for kids, we're creating that space again, yet another level for them. Um, so yeah. how about, uh, you know, how much do you deal, I think, again, primarily you're looking at supporting children and then also the, their, those who are supporting them. Um, how, how much of what you are, um, how much of your own energy and how much of, of what you're thinking about and, and doing is kind of addressing the adults in that situation, how it is that they can both best support their yeah. child who clearly has certain needs and then and then themselves as well. Yeah, I would say curiously that um, about half of my practice is working with adults because one of the ways we really help kids is helping their parents. And um, a lot of times for my adult work, um, a big piece of it has been helping them just normalizing what's going on around them and their responses is so familiar and universal and so many other people experiencing the same levels of stress, fatigue, worry, tiredness, hopelessness at times. Um, and then also like the tension that's springing up in families. There's, I mean, I had a little girl yesterday said, yeah, and mom and dad had a big fight, you know, as we were talking over Zoom. And I'm like, yeah, there's a lot of parents who are really kind of getting snappy with each other and grumpy and just normalizing that, yeah, it's not personal. It's what happens when we're all, you know, pushed up against each other and we're all fr um, nervous and worried. And um, so a big thing for me is having parents, one, have me and their therapist to be able to process some and share some of the emotion and have somebody able to listen where they don't have to worry about its impact on them. Mm -hmm. A lot of us some, um, can hold back our own worries because we don't want to make our partners or our spouses or somebody more worried. So we kind of sit with it ourselves sometimes um, in an effort to help but also leaving us a little isolated. And, and sometimes then our partners don't know why we seem preoccupied or, or why we're short-tempered. And um, there's this wonderful um, uh, doctor from LA, um, Dan Siegel, who's just amazing. He has a lot of resources and his website would be good to look at. But he has this lingo, he says, name it to tame it. That if you can name what's getting wild in you enough to name it to someone next to you all by itself it'll quiet a little bit well so uh because you've 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 opened the door to something else we want to make sure viewers leave here with and that is some resources uh that they can follow up on things with um you just mentioned uh dr siegel did you say yes and yeah. do you know his uh website um, um i you know do dansiegel.com is i mean just his name and he has a wonderful um, parenting book out called The Whole, um, Whole Brain Parenting. Um, and you can just Google him and he has a ton of mindfulness and parent um, exercises, things people can do that can help regulate them and their kids. And I'll have a list of um, materials that we can make sure to have available in print. Great. Great, and yeah. we will we will get make sure that we uh, include those graphically that that information mm -hmm. graphically when this interview 
goes out into the world. Yeah. Um, let me ask you about something that you mentioned uh, earlier, and that is the particular mm, difficulties and, uh, yeah, just the difficulties of dealing with custodial, shared custodial arrangements yeah. and children right now. Um, have you found, I, I know anecdotally of some situations in which one of the parents does not have access to their child um, for because it's been decided that it's best and safest for the child just to stay with the parent that they happen to be with. Yeah. Uh, is, that, is that a very common thing that you are finding, a common situation that you're finding? Is that the best, um, you know, is, is that is that what is often best or safest for the child? Do you, do you have anything um, that, that you can help, help that can help illuminate that for us, that situation? Yeah, I think um, what's, the crucial part is being able to have a dialogue, um, a, co a collaborative conversation with your co-parent, really about the multiple risk factors. Ironically, the child's, you know, right now we're learning from the scientists at least and the doctors that children are less at risk um younger children particularly i mean i think young adults are definitely at risk but one of the questions is the risk that it poses going back and forth to everybody in each family and i think that's a place where people's nervousness can really get high not knowing who's in one house that might have exposed the child that could then bring it to the other house and back and forth and not knowing, you know, being there, it's hard for people to evaluate the level of safety each house is doing. And that's all members in the house, not just the partner. So maybe, you know, if you and I were co-parenting, maybe I have confidence in you, but maybe you have teenagers in the house that you can't really speak for. And so I think recognizing that this is short to medium term, it will loosen up. and trying to find alternatives if it does happen that when kind of the shelter in place happened, the child was in one home. For visits that can happen virtually, for regular times that the child can be in touch and the other parent and child can connect. Um, I think that can help go a long ways. I have, sometimes there's active COVID in one family and then the quarantining has to happen and that can go on for a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, I, I don't know that, you, that there's any way of knowing this kind of thing in any definitive sense. I suspect there right. isn't, but um, do, you, do, you, do you feel like uh, whatever uh, is lost for the parent and the child mm -hmm. who are not in contact with each other for however long mm -hmm. this goes on, as you said, it could be short to medium term. It could be mm -hmm. weeks into, you know, longer than that. Um, is, is, is your assumption that that's, that's a recover, you know, whatever pain is inherent oh. in that happening is something that you, you know, you, people, both parties will get over, mm -hmm. so to speak? Um, um, I actually feel like the way it unfolds for the child, the least amount of conflict and stress that the care, get, that the parents have coming up with the solution is the best for the child, um, which often means as adults, we have to deal with our distress over it not going the way we need and want and put our needs second to what's best for the child. That sounds um, like parenthood to me. <laughs> yeah, and you know, parenthood sometimes stinks. It's sometimes really hard work and it hurts. And yet, you know, that's part of the, Part of the responsibility of parents is to make decisions best for all, not just our own desires. I still think no contact is different than regular contact that's not as rewarding. Like I said, you know, I was really surprised. My clients have really valued meeting with me in a way that I did not know it would be so important. And I think a child really values meeting with their parent they can't physically be with on a regular basis. Right. Um, so it may not touch that ache and that empty place, but it's going to mean a lot and it may go somewhere, you know, it may get ease it a little bit, soften it a little bit. 
Yeah, so if you happen to be the parent who is fortunate enough, one would assume, yeah. although not for every minute of the day, are you going to feel this way? But if you're the parent fortunate enough to be in, you know, to have the child, your child physically with you, um, perhaps you need to stay mindful and make some, some real, uh, you know, selfless uh, yeah. uh, moves for the benefit both of your mm -hmm. co-parent and, and, and your child um, themselves to create, as you said, you know, more yeah. opportunities for, for your child to be in touch with their co-parent. And I do want people to know that the parent who has the child with them all the time is not having an easy go of it either. <laughs> That's right. And there are parents with kids and they're working full time, trying to work while the kids are in the house. And it's, you know, it's trying to help very, the kids do their school work if there's, you know, if that's happening. Yeah, there's internet crashing for everyone at the same time who's in school and working. And so it's, it, it, it isn't a walk in the park the other way either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and this has been a fantastic conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I think that people uh, listening in are going to be leaving with um, a, a, a bunch of, you know, stuff they might not have thought about, but also mm -hmm. some really good strategies for addressing different things that are coming up because of our mm -hmm. weird, weird, weird living uh, conditions and working conditions yeah. at the moment. Really appreciate it. Um, let's talk just as a last uh, topic, mm -hmm. and then I'll, I'll want to invite you to mention anything we haven't covered okay. that you think is important, but as a last topic, how about yourself and yeah. others uh, similarly situated, the caregivers in many ways, mm -hmm. those who are caring for others and giving of themselves in that way? Who's, who's caring for you? How are you, mm -hmm. how are you doing that for yourself? But you've talked about it a little bit, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, what can we say for those who are in that caregiving position uh, for what resources they, they can access or what techniques or, or things they can do for themselves? Um, one is connecting with colleagues, um, letting people know, um, hearing how people are doing, um, and sharing stories, getting support that way is big. Um, I think for me, I think we're all still figuring it out. People, everybody I talk to is unbelievably tired at the end of every day and unsure now that it's past the crisis point and it's turning into kind of more, this can be a long-term um, process and we're realizing that. I think everyone's trying to figure it out. Mini breaks, movement, um, giving yourself like a screen-free day if you can on one day of the week, Friday or you know, Saturday or Sunday. Um, making sure you do a few things that really bring you joy. Uh, yeah, some, it, some really basic ideas, but so important to reiterate. One that's been really good if you walk right from your office into the home. Um, one tip I got was to go for a walk as if you were commuting home mm -hmm. to build in time to decompress because the transition from one door to the next, and then all of a sudden you're in the family is really jarring. Right, you need to take the long way around. <laughs> you gotta take the long way around. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's you know, a great, again, I think, I think for, for a certain number of people who are in exactly that situation, who have carved out some kind of workspace uh, within their homes and to which they retire to get their work done every day, um, that's that's great advice because I do think that if they can then walk downstairs and walk out the front door, uh, yeah. you know, and and go around the block and come back in, uh, they might find that 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 really has uh, a, a beneficial effect. I can imagine that. I think one piece that probably all of us are dealing with is a sense of lack of uh, lack of feeling like we're able to do enough whether it's, you know, the medical people in the front lines or therapists trying to telehealth or parents and all of us, it's like there's a sense that it's taken away some of people's feeling of agency and ability to help or make a difference. And um, 
So I've really have been trying to think about small things that make you feel like, okay, I'm, I've contributed something. Yeah, it's a great thing to, I mean, great thing to remind ourselves of what you just said, because mm -hmm. I started off the interview saying that I see you as operating on one of the front lines of this place. It's not really, of this uh, time, it's not really an acknowledged front line in the same way as, um, you know, everybody is aware of the yeah. kind of sacrifices being made. Um, by large segments of our medical community yeah. and first responders of different sorts, et cetera. Um, but there are an awful lot of people, like, just like yourself, engaged in um, dealing directly with the effects of this mm -hmm. new environment and new, these new circumstances. And it's important, uh, as I said, to, uh, mm -hmm. to understand not only that that's happening, but the kinds of things that you have to deal with that, that, yeah. that sense, like you were just saying that, Hey, you can't do enough. Yeah. Um, yeah. Even as you're working your butt off, yeah. I'm sure. And yeah. falling into bed exhausted every night. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anything else uh, before we sign off, anything that, Mm, strikes you that oh boy we, we we should have mentioned that or any other resources you'd like to share at this time obviously we mentioned we'll be we'll be posting yeah. resources we get from you um, um you know one thing that i thought would be really helpful uh, that we haven't touched on is the importance of putting together uh, a daily routine um for yourself and your family especially kids do so much better with routine and knowing when things are coming and what's coming and things that repeat. Um, so if the family has any way of, if you know a work schedule or a kid's schedule, if there's any way to create some kind of calendar that everyone can see um, so that people don't have to keep, one of the things we have a lot of is, you know, a kid just comes in and wants something. There's a lot of just no sense of where the boundary is and when you can be interrupted and not. Um, and that can, I mean, I'm finding that true for elder parents too. They're lonely, they have a question. And, um, you know, here in my house, we've been kind of talking in either the night before, usually we'll say what our days look like and when we have windows to be available and when not. And for kids, like what the schedule is so that even before, so you as a parent aren't trying to come up with something off the cuff when you're stressed and you've got a call coming and it, it's, it really has been helpful. A lot of my, a couple of my parents have talked about, okay, well let's make like a activity list for the di for the week. Like let's come up with five things you can plan to do. Um, so you don't have to come up with them and then find yourself, you know, playing Uno again for the 150th time. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so that can really calm people down. Even uh, like we just started this week, we're going for actually knowing when dinner's on the table, you know, instead of just whenever the person wanted to cook, you know, and, and everyone was like, wow, this was really helpful. Like I knew when I needed to be here, I could decide how much to snack, you know, and, and it, you could just hear people it organized them. It was something they could count on. Right. Um, yeah, the importance of structure, you know, which we've essentially lost in, in many right. ways. And uh, so recreating it somehow has been really, is really helpful for kids because they've lost all their structure. Um, and the predictability thing really helps our nervous system calm down. So lots of um, great uh advice and um and ideas for calming which is awesome um wondering as a very last question any kind of light funny any things that any anything that's that's happened uh, kind of coming out of this or that you've noted or anything like that that would be more on the lighter side um mm. if there isn't that's understandable but i figured you know I'd what have. one of the things i notice is a lot of people say, oh my God, I'm so glad I don't have to run from here to there to this soccer game and that practice or this. They're like, oh, it's so nice just to hang out with my family. You know, in between biting each other's head off <laughs> and, right. and yelling at each other, they're like, wow, we just get to like wake up together. You know, one kid looks so happy to have both her parents home for the day. 
you know, it's like little simple things like, oh, I can help with dinner. Like a kid ended up cooking something with their parents and they had all afternoon. So they made dinner together. They would have never done that. I'm getting a lot of really cute stories of like, yeah, we did this together. It was so much fun. And I know that if this, they weren't quarantined, you know, the kid would have said, no, I don't want to. I want to play with my friends. And right. so like these little moments are coming up. We're doing it in my house. What do we do? We're, we've been baking bread and trying different kinds and improving it. And everyone weighs in and we would never do that. <laughs> well, yeah, there's just, Right. There are too many other things to do when you right. get out there and do them, right? So, yeah, yeah seeing, I guess, uh, one, of the, one of the things I take from what you just said is just looking for, recognizing, and then taking advantage of opportunities mm -hmm. that are here that wouldn't other, you know, that are mm -hmm. along with the rest of this yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. And embracing and celebrating those because they will go away again. <laughs> that's right. As soon as we can go back to playing with our friends, etc., that's most probably what we'll do, whether we're kids yeah. or otherwise. And yeah. it'll be so hard to find each other again, you know, like, yep. oh my God, they're not responding, etc. So, your kids all right, are well, you're like not worth the time of day when their friends are around. <laughs> Good. Well, thank you so much. Um, really, really do appreciate it, and I think that it's gonna, it's going to uh, be a real benefit to our audience. Good. To tune I hope so. Finish. I hope people are find something useful in there, and um, also people just people have the most creative ideas. It's amazing just to ask each other what what'd you come up with. Mm -hmm. Well, we will do that, and. Uh, Good. And uh, we will wish you the best in your continued work. I hope that you Thank fall you. asleep a little less exhausted every day, every Thank night you. going forward from here. Well, and, thanks so uh, much for having me. You bet. We will talk to you again. Um, All right. I have been talking to Ann Westcott, uh, clinical social worker and um, source of excellent ideas and resources. So we'll share all of those with you. We appreciate you being here. I'm James Milan. This is Talk of the Town. We'll see you later.